my computer says it's 1600 so i i would like to welcome everybody to this event and our focus on uh, science and technology and innovation in ministry of defense where we've got three very well qualified speakers uh, to to take us through what i'm sure will be a, a really interesting discussion uh, if i could just very briefly introduce the the three speakers uh, john ridge is i think the second director of innovation in the ministry of defense uh, and uh, is a former soldier but has moved into uh, <clears throat> into the civil service and into working for government uh, in different roles but he's been now director of innovation for uh, about nine about nine months i'm counting roughly a bit less than that um and uh, that role is uh, interestingly described in his in his CV is to to help implement policy process and cultural changes across MOD uh, in order to make the department more adaptable, agile, and able to exploit the opportunities that are available to new technology. So when I hear about somebody's job is to generate cultural change in MOD, I I respect at least <laughs> it's due. Uh, Chris Cooper is a is a scientist. If I said scientist through and through, Chris, that that would um, <clears throat> I think one of my former Cranfield numbers would would perhaps you'd describe you as he said, I like hard sums, and I think Chris probably falls into that category as well. Uh, but his job is to uh, cor uh, corral scientific advice from across the MOD from about a hundred people across the MOD into uh, advice for the chief scientific advisor and into the ministry of, as, as a whole. And then we have Anita, uh, Anita Friend, who works at DASA, which I suspect many in the audience have heard of or are familiar with. But DASA has, I think, uh, <clears throat> in its second incarnation, but it's been viewed as a successful organization for prompting and getting money into small businesses so that they can ha help uh, really get projects going and get innovative technologies moving. And it, it addresses a very uh, wide range of subjects now that in the competitions that it offers. So Anita has got responsibility there. There are three speakers. I, <clears throat> I, I have, let me just glance at my writing instructions. My writing instructions say that if you would like to submit questions, please put them in the chat function and uh, the chat function. <clears throat> and I will I will take them out from there and, and direct them on. The guidance is the earlier you put in your question, the better chance you have of getting it uh, addressed in, in, in the event of us having a large number of questions. Um, the um <clears throat> the the talks are all on the record and um I, normally on Rusi we uh <clears throat> we have questions that are off the record uh but uh in this kind of circumstances it's pretty difficult so i would just ask our speakers to really expect that everything here is going to be on the record um uh, <clears throat> So uh, <clears throat> that those are the basic instructions. We've we've got an hour, and uh, we I know that the speakers would like to get as many questions as they can. So I, I think we'll start off by asking them to give their uh, presentations, which I expect are going to be pretty punchy. And uh, John, if you'd like to start, we'll go John, Chris, uh, Anita in in that order. My eyes are moving because of where you sit on my screen. But uh, John, thank you very much indeed. Um, and hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on our approach to innovation and where we see things going over the next couple of years. What I'll do is a hand over to Chris, who we will go into a bit more detail about science and technology, and then Anita can close off, particularly around the engagement with uh, industry through uh, DASA and particularly the role of small and medium sized enterprises. So we will leave loads of time at the end for questions. So in terms of where we are at the moment, um, we have an innovation framework which has been in place now for a little while. That's our strategy, which talks about people, process and pipeline. Uh, so it sets out a whole series of sort of policies and everything else to help people innovate across defense. 
And I suppose the key, we then have two portfolios of pro projects which we use to effectively drive progress in specific areas. So there are spearheads and game changers. The spearheads are relatively mature technology which are solving current problems. So to give you an idea, uh, a bit on command and control, something around uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, and a spearhead doing anti-submarine warfare. So that, that's mature tech, current problems. The game changers are then our big bet. So we've got some game changers which are much less mature tech, and that's broadly about building an evidence base for a potential future requirement. So some of the stuff we're doing in there around direct energy weapons, for instance, uh, gives you an idea of where that's going. So all of this has been going for a little while. Um, what's going well? I would say we've got a really uh, a vibrant ecosystem. You talked a little bit about culture. I think there is a culture now where large chunks of the organization feel uh, comfortable innovating, coming up with ideas. Uh, and I think also through particularly what DAS has done, we've got some pretty good links into SMEs. More work to do, but um, that feels like quite a positive story. There are some challenges though. Um, I would say that we're pretty good at ideas and inventions. We're pretty good at turning inventions into prototypes and fielding them and finding that they're successful. Where we're really struggling at the moment is scaling that out across defense so that they become sort of core capabilities. And that's the same for ideas as it is for tech as well. The uh, integrated review and uh, the defense command plan refresh have given us sort of chance to reflect on where we are. Um, we've been working really closely with Rob Johnson and the SONAC team, and many of you will have seen the stuff that Rob's been doing to build an evidence base for the Minister of Armed Forces of sorts of ideas that people have come up with for how defence should respond to the integrated re refresh. And then we will continue to work with Strategic Hub once those ideas um, are taken on board to, to help draft the defence uh, command plan refresh. I'd pick out two, two things that we're using that are lessons from Ukraine, which are driving some of the thinking, and there's obviously much more than this. But Ukraine's really interesting because it provides two lessons. One is around the war of industrial capacity, and then a very different lesson around the war of adaptation. And I'm, from an innovation perspective, particularly interested in this idea of adaptation, and particularly the requirement to adapt at really significant speed. So we that's about introducing new technology, but frankly, it's also about repurposing existing technology. So th I think that's a really interesting lesson, uh, and I would offer that at the moment, um, we don't necessarily deliver and I, that bit of getting from ideas and invention through into field of capability at the speed that we're going to need to. And there are all sorts of reasons why that's not the case. Um, I think we over specify to industry rather than presenting them with problems and getting them to help solve them. That over specification leads to delay. We've got very bureaucratic processes. Uh, and I think the way we consider risk needs a bit of work because we tend to compartment risk around not having a capability, so the sort of operational risk, and we deal with that slightly separately from all the risks around procurement, whether that's commercial, financial, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm really keen that we consider those in the round, because certainly when you talk to operational commanders, they're really interested in the risk that they're currently holding from not having a capability that they can field. So there's a lot of work to do on there. What are we doing about it? So uh, we are working really closely with DNS and Andy Start, the new Chief Executive Officer down there, is doing some really interesting work around reshaping DNS and what that means for procurement. So uh, we're working with them to, to work out how our procurement system becomes uh, a bit more agile. We're also working on how we provide a clearer innovation demand signal to the system. So as I say, we've got a really vibrant ecosystem, but to a certain extent, people get on with what they're interested in without necessarily being focused on defense's most pressing problems. So there's something about a clear demand signal. We're also working on how we down select more ruthlessly and all the stuff I see in the private sector is that the, the good companies are very good at killing ideas that aren't succeeding early and reinvesting that resource. So we're doing some work on that. Um, and we're also doing some stuff on that bit that I talked about going from successful prototype through to scale capability. So we've got a proposal called the exploitation engine, which is around building some evidence base around successful um, research and development projects so that we then are able to take much faster decisions uh, aligned with unlocking our equipment plans so that you can then find the resources to scale those successful research and development projects out uh, across more broadly. And then finally, bringing all of that together, we're doing something we're called rewiring, which is around looking at how the innovation ecosystem links together, where the, uh, the sort of dropped um, links are so that we can make that a more effective and, and a more rapid system. So um, I think this has got some really profound implications, well, it's definitely got profound implications for defense, but I also think there's some really profound implications for industry. And we had a really interesting session a few days ago talking to industry 
about what our industrial base needs to look like as we head towards the 2030s. How do we integrate some of the big tech companies more closely into what we're doing? How do we make it easier for the, the really interesting SMEs to break into what can be quite a difficult system? And how do we achieve a better balance in our, um, in our sort of equipment plan between exquisite and mass? And I think that's got some fascinating implications for industry. We've got the defence and security industrial strategy, um, which makes very clear that the fact that defence uh, that defense industries and security industries are a kind of strategic capability in their own right. Uh, in their own right, we've also got the defence capability framework, which then sets out the high level challenges, uh, the sort of five challenges: pervasive, full spectrum, multi spectrum, uh, multi domain ISR, uh, command and control, um, sub threshold advantage, asymmetric car power, and freedom of access and manoeuvre. So we've we've set those out but it doesn't feel like that has transformed the relationship that we've got with industry. Um, and arguably, I mean, just as I read those things out, there's something around uh, a next layer of detail in plain English, hopefully, which allows people to have a very, very clear idea of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and before I hand over to Chris, I'll just leave you with one final thought, which is, I've talked a bit about defence. I've talked a bit about defence industry. I'm really interested in the role of private investment as well. So. How do we attract venture capital to this? How do we unlock some of their challenges around ESG? And where are our sort of future defense and security unicorns, uh, unicorns and how do we get private money um, to support those? Because defense isn't gonna have the money, enough money to do it on its own. So I'm gonna stop there and I will hand over to Chris uh, to talk a bit more detail about science and tech. Thanks very much, uh, John. Uh, I think the first thing that, that I'll do is, is probably explain to those is, is why uh, the MOD talk about science and technology and innovation and R&D separately. And so the way that I, I, like, I like to think of it is we, we've kind of taken the term science and technology as, if, if you imagine the analogy of a, around a golf, uh, so research and development uh, is basically research the first few holes and development the last few holes. Um, and what, what we've classed as science and technology is basically the golf clubs. It's the, it's the tools, the ability, the people, the stuff to actually sort of allow you to play in the game. Um, how that characterized in terms of what we do in the science and technology world in MOD, uh, that's very much about the research, but also enabling these tools to sort of uh, research these opportunities and also work to help sort of develop with the sort of systems in integration, uh, system, uh, agile development and so on. Um, so that's, that's just a, a little bit about the, the common one about what, what do you mean by s and um, we set out in 2020, uh, basically a strategy, which kind of looked to try and put science and technology in, I would say, in a more assertive position within the, in the MOD. And um, so to talk about that in terms of uh, the future of, of the MOD, uh, the, the science and technologists often have, and the analysts, have that blend of understanding of what the implications of the changing threat is, what the implications of future operating environment, but also the opportunities that sort of research and innovation could potentially provide and sort of draw that together. Uh, and so taking a sort of stronger role to try and um, set out what future we're trying to uh, get to. And as uh, John referred to earlier, in terms of the, uh, the sort of strategic capability uh, challenges that, that the defense has, has published, those sort of stem out of that s and insight about what that future could be and what opportunities uh, research and innovation could provide to actually give the strategic edge we're trying to go in. And so we set out that need to actually sort of have a much more data-driven approach to understanding that future. So understanding research frontiers to stop trying to chase the last, last year's technology, really. Um, I think when you see the sort of global re race for science and technology, in a lot of the battles, we're, we're kind of behind and we, will, we would never catch up. But there's a real opportunity that defense can provide to see what is the next thing we should be after that's about the sort of confluence of technology to offer that sort of strategic advantage. One of the other things we're looking to do about understanding the future is, is to not just wait until we've developed and built new things to understand what they do, but actually improve that sort of offer into defense to characterize what those new conceptual opportunities are around. And to do that, to really drive into our force development uh, to match that sort of capability pull that we get from, from, from defense in terms of what its capability needs and what military effects it needs to drive in the in the future but also how the tech push could potentially sort of answer those questions and test it to give us those opportunities for future different force structures different ways of achieving military effect as well as improving what we're already doing but for that to work 
uh, we've got to make the right decisions. And so another critical part of our s and strategy is making sure that we're a great scientific department. And I don't mean doing just doing great science. Uh, I think it's also around making sure that there's the right evidence and the right decisions made across the whole of defense to actually allow us to seize those opportunities that science and technology can provide. And I'll come more of that in a second. Uh, in terms of making the right decisions now, there's always a wonder, there's, there's a war in Europe going on, as we, as we well know. And there's always a tendency to focus on the last war or even the current war. And so there's a, there's a position that, that the MOD must take as balancing what we describe as that generation after next of capability. And what I mean by that is where we haven't solved the scientific or technological problem yet, uh, but we know we need to, to achieve the sort of decisive, device, decisive effects we're looking for. Um, but we need to balance that with the needs of our current support to operations, but also that ability to get the next generation of capability and work as part of that sort of innovation enterprise with the rest of the defense to help accelerate through those things where we've kind of solved the technological problem, but the key is going to get it, get it integrated into military capability. Uh, another, out, uh, another approach that we have to do, of course, is sustain critical SNC capabilities on our defense. We've seen them over the years, the likes of forensic capability, the CBRN support to Salisbury, those kind of things. So balancing that capability pull with that tech push for that generation after next with that sustainment of capabilities. Uh, but we also need to help defense get into the opportunity, which is where it's a real enterprise problem. So we, with new technologies, often there's ethical, legal policy barriers to actually get in the way of us actually getting ahead of the game. Uh, so when it comes to some of the exciting things on the horizon, like wearable technologies, human organization, and so on, if we can solve those, anticipate and solve those policy barriers now, we have that opportunity to roll out pace in line with the kind of acceleration work that John's describing through our sort of vibrant innovation ecosystem. Uh, to help it work, we, we, we've looked to sort of almost like take a bottom up and a top down approach to refine our collaboration using that tech push uh, as articulated things like our defense technology framework, and then sort of maturing that in terms of specific applications and balancing that with the capability poll that's published through uh, Millcap's defense capability framework, while all the time working to uh, find those opportunities to feed into the innovation system to allow us to actually accelerate to get the sort of technological advantage we need. But last but not least, it's almost like force us to, um, uh, to do our homework and actually look at the impact of, of our spend. And I think it's fairly evident that defense is quite a large spender in terms of um, uh, from a government position, uh, but in terms of research and development and S&C and that innovation across the piece, um, it's, it's small fry. And I think one of the things we have to do to understand where we're getting the benefit that we need is to actually measure how the science and technology, how the research we're doing actually changes the price of fish sort of down the line. So that's in a nutshell, kind of our strategic attempt for science and technology. So I think now we're going to pass over to Anita uh, to talk uh, more about the innovation and acceleration world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, so John and, and Chris have very much um, spoken very much to the, the the why, why we kind of need science and technology and innovation in order and the kind of the, the case for, for um, maintaining and, and indeed regaining strategic advantage. Um, the bit that I'm going to kind of focus on is, is the kind of the outward looking bit. So the role of DASA is how do we harness the capability that sits within industry writ large and academia and how we can harness that in a way that complements what Chris has been describing in terms of the, the UK um, global leading um, science and technology capability and innovation that is happening across the defence and security landscape. Um, so I think... First and foremost, when we talk about that strategic advantage, um, there, there's, there's, it's worth just unpacking that slightly. So I guess the one thing we can be uncertain of, we can be certain about about the future is that it will be uncertain and it will be challenging. Um, and therefore we need the widest range of perspectives if we are to have the solutions that can address the problems that we're going to face. And we need those um, solutions to be agile and we need to be able to pull them through rapidly. Secondly, s and is both an opportunity and a threat. Um, so as Chris described, and to stretch his sort of golf analogy further, we've got a brilliant set of golf clubs from within, within government. 
But actually, if we're going to play this very best set of um, golf, we actually need to be able to get to the very best golf clubs out there quicker than our adversaries that are trying to cause us harm. Because we know that they can access science and technology easily. We know that you no longer have to be a government with lots of money and resource at your disposal in able to enable to make use of science and technology. And so science and technology can be used for the good, but it can also be used for the bad. And so actually, this is really about a race to get to those um, those s &T opportunities quicker than our reversaries can and to be able to pull that through to, to the end uh, sort of user so that we have effect. Um, in terms of um, kind of key principles that sit behind our approach to that, um, as John sort of alluded to, um, we have um, DSIS that kind of really talks about a need to have a stronger partnership and engagement and a real kind of transparent dialogue with industry and academia and to really see it as untapped capability that we need to be able to harness. And kind of second to that, within the Ministry of Defence innovation, innovation operating model, um, it talks about needing to have a continuous, open and transparent dialogue at all stages. And that needs to start with being able to match ideas to problems um, and then to move across to the actual so what to those ideas. So what do those ideas mean in terms of what they can unlock for defence and security? So what difference do they make? But also, what are the practicalities in terms of how we turn it into reality, both from a government perspective um, and a national security perspective, but also from a commercial perspective? Because ultimately, um, suppliers, industry, um, academia, you ultimately want to make a living. Um, and it is important that we bear that in mind. Um, and it is important that we bear in mind that actually prosperity and national security are intricately linked. So if one goes up, the other also goes up. Um, and so actually considering the two as, as an integrally linked kind of set of concepts is really important for us. In terms of DAS's approach, our mission, as I've already alluded to, is to find and fund exploitable innovation for the benefit of national security and UK prosperity. What that really means is that we help um, match ideas that come from outside of government to the biggest national security challenges um, that we face. Um, and then we enable suppliers um, to actually um, help us with those problems. So to actually help you fix our problems in a way that we can make use of. Um, and so our approach within DASA kind of breaks down into three kind of core capability pillars. So the first is about being able to find ideas. So that's really about being able to reach out into a diverse range of different suppliers and to be able to help um, suppliers understand how whatever it is that you're developing actually might be relevant to national security problems. So to help you with that matching, to help you kind of do that joining of dots and to kind of get that realisation that defence and security is something that you can contribute to and something that you can make a positive contribution for the better to um, contribute towards a safer future. The second pillar is about funding ideas and actually it's more than funding. Um, so we fund uh, the best ideas and we give them R&D contracts. Um, and that is really about ensuring that we can um, help uh, those suppliers develop their technology and science in a way that is relevant and useful for national security. But it's more than that. It's actually an indication to suppliers that this is something that defence and security are actually interested in. Behind those funding decisions sits a robust assessment that comes from multidisciplinary assessors from across government, from scientists, from technologists, from strategists to policymakers across the national security system. So being awarded funding from DASA is not just funding to spend on your R&D to make sure that you're developing it in a way that is relevant and to ultimately secure an end contract. It's a badge that actually we have looked at this and this is something that is a priority concern to defence and security. And that is important from when we start to think about how we tap into the investor community, because it's starting to de-risk those investments as something that actually have a future within national security and are actually wanted and needed and ultimately um, lead to investment. And I should also add um, that for any of our calls, any of our ideas to be funded, there will be a customer from national security that is linked to that idea. So a customer who has said, this is something that I want and need and I'm interested in enabling.
The third pillar to what data does is really about enabling innovation. And that falls down into two key areas. So one is about leveling the playing field. So that's about helping suppliers understand what defense and security want and need and how to work with us. So how to navigate the landscape, what are the obstacles that you might um, come across along the way in terms of getting your idea to something that can actually be procured. Um, and the second is around um, helping to de-risk um, your, your sort of business um, and to help you think about what the viable deliverable model is for you to get that um, idea into reality. And that will look quite different for different types of suppliers. So for some SMEs, that is about de-risking them and helping them to attract external investment from venture capitalists and the like, helping them to build the business behind their idea so that they actually have a credible business plan and um, that will stand up to scrutiny um, and which has um, some, a slightly wider base than possibly um, a more narrow sort of defense uh, kind of gap. Um, or it can be partnering, helping uh, suppliers to partner with other suppliers and helping you identify which suppliers may be of interest and the sorts of questions and things that you might need to consider in order to do that. Or it may be that you actually just want to sell your IP um, and for, for defense or security uh, to use. And it can be any of those three things um, and data really are there to sort of enable and support that decision making um, and to kind of help you ask the right questions and to work out what is best and then to provide the support along the way. In terms of our kind of key learning from all of that, I think I'd pull out three points. So one is that if we want the very best ideas, we have to be pulling our ideas from a diverse range of sources. And that means that we need to accept that we don't currently have a level playing field within, within defense and security. There are some suppliers that will have quite a limited understanding about what we do within defense and security. They will have limited networks and contacts. And if we want to be able to harness their expertise, their capabilities and their science and technology, then we need to help them. So we need to help them make the links. We need to help them understand the landscape and we need to help translate um, defense and security speak into plain English that they will understand and that they can use to, to tweak and refine their products. Um, the second is that it isn't all about technology and science. It's far from it. Actually, for this to work, then we need to be thinking about the business angle as well. So what will work from a commercial perspective? What will work from a business perspective as well as what will work from a defence and security perspective? And that comes back to national security and UK prosperity going hand in hand. And actually, the two need to be considered together. And the, the final point that I would make is one that John, John made at the beginning, which is about ease. And actually, if we want to attract and if we want to support the very best ideas from the wider world in to help defence and security, we have to make it as easy as we can from a supplier perspective. So we have to, in designing our processes, um, actually take into account that not every supplier has the same needs, not every supplier will have the same journey that they want to go in. So we have to build in equity into our system. So we need to have different options that will work for different types of suppliers. Um, and we need also um, to build collaboration in from the start, because ultimately you'll hear a lot of people saying that innovation is a team sport. It really is a team sport. And actually it requires a fusion of expertise from government, from scientists, from policymakers, from strategists, and from industry and academia. And so part of what DASA does is try to act as a convener of those partnerships to help those conversations happen at the right time and to provide support along the way. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you all very much. The um, There was a huge amount of material there for uh, even for uh, somebody that's fairly familiar with this area to absorb. Uh, and there are already uh, quite a lot of questions. I've got 13 questions on, on the list. Uh, so um, let, me, uh, let me start with, um, I, I'll do as I suggested at the beginning and take the early one. There's, there's one from... Uh, Chris T, which I think has been uh, significantly addressed, but I'll, I'll raise it because he's, he, are we content with how MOD science and technology feeds into the wider cross-government method of setting strategy for prosperity and security? 
I think Anita, you said quite a lot about that. I don't know if anybody would like to add anything. I'm, I'm happy to say a few things. I mean, I think one of the things um, that's quite challenging for defence is um, in terms of the science within government, we're one of the departments, along with like health, um, obviously the new department or the, or the research councils uh, that has one of the biggest internal spends on science and technology. And so mapping it into with that, that sort of wider prosperity piece is quite interesting because we, I think unlike um, most departments and most of the sort of government agenda is our desired outcome is improved military effects primarily uh, through uh, science and technology. And so where there are obviously synergies, we look to sort of characterize the defense missions that the, the technology push is helping to address with areas of critical national strength, because clearly that allows us to have that ability to feed in defense requirements. And I think a, a critical, previously a lot of the innovation would sit within defense itself, but ne nowadays most of the innovation sits in the private sector in the non-defense uh, sector. So the, the, the critical part that we feed in is having a much clearer articulation of what it, what we're trying to get out of the technological development and the scientific expertise that sits within the com country. How that translates into the prosperity agenda is the, the ideal situation is that provides the stimulus into where there's sufficient demand for there to be uh, a coherent manufacturing need within an industry, which is largely, I think, where the profit is likely to sort of sit. And so by, by much being much clearer about defence interests and less guarded, which I think previously we potentially would be because we could do it most of it ourselves, we're, we're trying to be as open as possible to feed those requirements in and stimulate innovation into areas that suit us. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll move on. Um, and, and actually, the second question is much more sort of, uh, if you like, uh, reflective of Ukraine. And that's uh, from, from someone called Rowley Sword, who says, what are the main constraints on industry in their ability to ramp up industrial capacity to meet in, increased demand? Is there anything that you that the S&T world can, can do in that I mean, challenging problem with which are, I'm pretty familiar. But uh, there's the question for you: Is is has S and T got a role there? Shall I, shall I kick off, and then I'll hand to um, Chris. Might want to talk on the specific of S and T. I mean, the, the the problems I think are reasonably um, public, which is around the sort of depth of our supply base. Uh, our ability to get hold of some of the, the sort of scarce componentry that's required, particularly in sort of complex weapons and, and stuff like that. So there's, there's definitely a lot of work uh, required to build resilience in our supply chain. And that's absolutely, I'd be very surprised if that's not a strong theme in the Defence Command paper refresh. I, whether it's S&T or innovation, I genuinely do think there are some opportunities to look at both um, more innovative supply chains and also more innovative manufacturer as well. So as, a, as an example, um, more modularity in our systems, whether it's our platforms or our weapon systems, might allow us to produce them more quickly at times of need. There is always going to be a balance because we the reason we've got relatively fragile stockpiles is because over the years we've taken frankly very sensible decisions about how much we should stock when we were facing a different sort of threat now that threat has changed i think there's a recognition that stockpiles need to increase but um i don't know if chris or or anita want to pick up anything more specific on the s t side yeah I, I can i can pick up from 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 our side one of the things that we're quite keen uh to do from a purely s t side uh stand past john's comments about the capability needs is to have a much smoother demand signal going into uh, the the to industry that goes fur further ahead. I think that's 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 our biggest worry. That over the years we think we've, I'd say, see seesaw, but oscillated quite significantly in terms of what we need and when, and switching direction. And, and that's where I think uh, the the consistency of the capability pull of the problems defence is looking to address. I think is one of the main ways we can do to actually show that we're not going off in different directions. The the whole point of that of that piece is it's the attempt is to try and be solution agnostic to allow people to innovate in the ways that suit them, but with that constant demand in terms of what 
outcomes we're looking to achieve rather than solutions, because otherwise the solutions will change once the next technology uh, cab comes off the rank. So I think <clears throat> I think by being open, as I, as I mentioned, but also to, to sort of continue to continue engage as how our thoughts are changing, as well as some of those longer term pieces, it's probably where where we can improve and where we're looking to improve with the various sort of for uh, for an industry engagement over. Anita, is any of your are any of your competitions uh, addressing this sort of area, or is this a, a novel thing for you? Um, so some of our competitions have indirectly um, addressed it, and we've and we've um, supported in uh, to to the effort as you might expect. Um, and indeed, we have some suppliers um, that have been supported by data that have now got their capability that is actually being used within within the Ukraine. So, yes, we, we certainly play a role. And as Chris and John have said, that kind of open dialogue and um, that problem um, sort of basis and, make, and thinking about innovation, not just in terms of the technology, but also in terms of process and ways of manufacture. So it's kind of innovation in all its guises um, needs to be considered. Thank you. Uh there's a the question that suggests, and I think it's a DASA question. Um, would it be possible to consider longer research lead times to allow institutions to ensure sufficient staff are in place for the commencement of projects? I think this is the issue about whether you whether, whether you can only bid when you've got capability, but you don't have funding for that capability. That's pretty expensive. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that, Anita? I think that's one particularly for you. Yeah, no, certainly. So I think first and foremost, it's worth saying that a lot of the DASA calls, not all of our calls, are at the lower TRL end of the spectrum. So it is not anticipated that you have a fully fledged capability. It's a relatively early and emerging idea. And actually, the funding that we give you is funding to help you develop that idea in a way that is relevant um, for defence and or security. Um, the second is is really, um, and that is often done in multi phases. So it will be the first phase might be moving from a very low TRL um, to to sort of proof of concept, and then the second phase might be proof of concept um, to a prototype or something along those lines. Um, so it's kind of pitching into the opportunities that are at the right end of the spectrum, and our innovation partners that are across the country can help match ideas to the right opportunities that we have that we have available. Um, and the second thing is that our application process is deliberately designed to be um, as easy and sort of um, low effort, I guess, in terms of its, its process. So what we're not asking for is reams and reams of sort of essay like sort of justification as to what you have developed. We try to keep it as as quick and as easy for you as possible, noting that actually we want to attract the best range of ideas in a raw format because actually part of the working with us is, is us helping you and working in partnership to help you collect, um, enhance them in a way that is useful. If, if I'm not, mis I may be misinterpreting the question, but I think the question is that when people make a proposal, <clears throat> if they, if they, when they make the proposal and it's accepted, they need some time to recruit some extra people, whereas the deadlines that you have make it very difficult for them. I, I may be misinterpreting the question, but that's how I took it. OK, um, yeah, so in, in that case, um, yes, I mean, there usually is some flex in terms of, of those timeframes. It's usually it has been dictated by the customer requirement as to how quickly they need that capability um, to, to come to fruition. Um, but um, there is, as with most of the things of Industrial Sun Flex, so it is worth having a conversation uh, with our innovation partners to see to see what can be done. That's helpful. Just, can I just just pick you up a little bit on that because I think there's a there's a broader issue which the the questioner hints at, which is these sort of breaks that you get through a pipeline, where for all sorts of reasons, whether it's around annularity of funding or whether it's around going from research and development to a core programme, which obviously sometimes involves a, a change in the colour of money that, uh, on one side or the other. We're doing some work around how you get a more um, sort of coherent look at the pipeline so that you might compete reasonably early uh, and say to people, here's a problem we want to solve. Could you come along and provide us in three months' time with a prototype which goes some way towards solving that? And at the end of that will be a, a substantial prize rather than sort of drip-feeding research development money. 
there'll be a substantial prize which allows people to then make those investments exactly as they're describing. I've had a very similar complaint around um, where they will we will build a build an expectation. There'll be a number of particularly security cleared staff are brought in to do something. Um, that sort of all goes quiet for a bit, and then we go. Yeah, no, we changed. We definitely want that thing. And they said, well, we had to release those stuff. So there's, there's something around. It's a bit like Chris was talking earlier in terms of those sort of blips, those ups and downs in terms of demand signal. We need to give people more certainty. That's one of the things that's come up from a lot of the conversations I've had with industry. OK, thank you. Um, I, I, I must emphasize that I'm suppressing all my questions here. <laughs> 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 the... Um, <clears throat> The next one, well, there's there are two questions I'll put at you, because, uh, and and then maybe you can uh, allocate them. Uh, the first is we haven't mentioned climate change so far, and somebody says how much a climate. Uh, uh, Martin Day asks how much a climate change and sustainability hired wired into innovation. I suppose that takes you into the ESG piece. And the other question is uh, people mentioning the the challenges of integrating industry partners. Uh, and um, <clears throat> there's a question about the model that you use to reduce challenges here and, and how, how can you uh, manage the risks and demands that are involved? Well, I'm, I'm happy to kick off on, I'm happy to kick off on both of those, but I, I'd really welcome other thoughts as well. So just touching on climate change to start with, um, clearly climate change is a driver of insecurity so therefore we're interested in it just in its own right uh, there is a an awful lot of work going into thinking around um, electrification battery electrification around better battery capabilities around greener technologies so there is a there is a whole swathe of uh, programs looking at um, zero effectively reducing defense's uh, contribution to the, the climate change challenge so there's a whole load of work around that and that has a dual benefit because by reducing your supply chains particularly around things like uh, bringing in aviation fuel or fuel for vehicles if you can reduce that requirement you can have it has both operational and technical um, improvements as well as having a, a sort of green agenda so there's definitely a load more but um, and chris and anita i'm sure will be able to think of far better examples than me in terms of the challenges of integrating partners, um, there is the, the conversations that I've had um, with industry around this. There are there are a number of frustrations. One is it's really hard to interact with defence because there are just so many of us. And which person do you talk to? There's definitely something around having a secure platform. So it's quite easy to do stuff at official. The moment you step above that, particularly for small medium-sized enterprises who won't be um, list x facilities it's very difficult to engage at above officials so there is quite a lot of work and thinking going on about that most importantly i think is engaging industry earlier um, and were general Rob mcgowan on the line he would talk about how he is trying to bring industry in much more closely to both concept and capability development into the room as we're having those discussions because by integrating industry thinking and the opportunities that they see earlier we will get better solutions, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on those two issues? Uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit about the climate change and maybe if Anita then wants to anything more about the integrating industry partners. So from a uh, S&T delivery side within MOD, we've set up a specific sort of support, sustainability and climate change programme, which is lifed over four years, where the intent of the programme is to stop it at the point we've not had it outside the box doing research on its own but it's actually integrated those needs across all the research we do that's the sort of defined end point of the program so i guess the, the we'll be able to judge at that end of program point is the ideal situation is it will no longer be something that's considered in isolation it will be fully integrated into all of our research priorities and all of the research done across our portfolio which hopefully is the anti we're hoping for. Anita. Thank you, and happy to add a bit more to the sort of integrating of industry bit. So I think John's point around um, the earlier engagement of industry is, is crucially important because I think that is what allows us to make sure that our sort of internal pull through processes are so the things that will enable us to bring the technology into, into service and have benefit 
are absolutely aligned with the opportunities that are out there and that we we've, we've kind of got those two the push and the pull are working in tandem with one another rather than in isolation and separate i think the other thing um, that we can do and that we can do here and now is in in providing advice um on how to work with with defense um and security i think that really is um about us helping suppliers work out who they need to work with who they need to contact who they need to partner with so kind of that navigation bit so i think part of that is us trying to hide some of the wiring so recognizing as john mentioned that the the wiring of the defense innovation and science and technology system is incredibly complex and vast um, what we're trying to do is to do more on doing that hard leg work for you so you just come in to one easy front door and then uh, we do that hard leg work for you in helping to link you up with the right people so you don't actually need to worry about that bit as much um, and kind of link to that um, kind of making sure that actually the, the people that you're talking to are genuinely serious about what it is um, that you are developing. So we're not wasting either their time or your time in having those quite involved conversations. Um, so I think that's something that we are doing right away and will continue to do more of us as John as John explained. Thank you. I'm daunted uh, because we haven't budgeted enough time or taken enough time of you. <laughs> we have 25 questions sitting in this uh, in, in this pile. Uh, I'll take one of them, which uh, <clears throat> I think is, is a familiar one, but it refers to getting things through the valley of death. Uh, and, uh, and going to the, let's link that to the integrated uh, uh, integration of industry. Uh, how much have you got, in this terms of this early engagement of industry, how much are the customers, namely the single services, uh, sort of psychologically oriented towards this and um, and also how much are the procurement bodies I, I, I won't tell you my horror story from DNS but uh, where you know sometimes there is traditionally reluctance to see early engagement with industry because it favors people and it hinders competition so um, <clears throat> and if, if we could uh, Take that point about the valley of death and see if anything else comes out of that. So the, valley, it's, the first thing to point out is the valley of death is not always a bad thing. So the valley of death is sometimes quite a good way to kill bad ideas. So we don't want everything to get over the valley of death. There's also, someone described it to me, um, in fact, I think it was uh, Will who heads up the Defence Innovation Unit, said it's more about a series of stepping stones rather than valley of death. And sometimes you put your foot in the water. So it's not a single thing. There's a whole series of handoffs that may or may not happen at the right time. And, and therefore, the good idea eventually moves through this sort of complex pathway all the way through to their fielding capability. The, the biggest gap seems to be, as I mentioned earlier, between successful prototype and scaled equipment program, for one to own expression. They're not always equipment programs, but that's sort of scaled out across defense. The reason that's difficult is because you're moving from basically two different systems. You're moving from a system configured around research and development to our EP and all the acquisition stuff that goes with that. Uh, Andy Starr and the stuff he's doing in DNS is absolutely trying to get at this. There is a challenge that if it's a big program, you tend to have to take a decision around tens or hundreds of millions to a board and a whole series of assurance processes, which run on a cycle that's built around our annual budgetary cycle. So sometimes we introduce some very significant delays by just saying, well, you can't even have that decision around that program for another two years, because that's the next time that the EP is gonna come up. So we're doing some work around how you build some freedom into our equipment program so that you can drop things that you no longer need in order to buy stuff that you do so there are some real challenges around that i'm not i'm not kind of I, I wouldn't want people to underestimate how difficult some of the process is around that um i'm confident that we can do it but we also one of the ways we can get through this is by configuring our equipment plan so that instead of it all being wrapped up in very highly specified single programs we're building in the ability to do spiral development through it so that you can integrate new things that pop out of science and technology into your ship, your plane, your tank, whatever else, rather than having to build a new one. And that feels to me like a really important way to do it. Um, but I, I, I know others will have a view, particularly Anita, uh, around this. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I, I think of, as John's described, like the kind of the biggest kind of challenge in the in the valley of death is that sort of final bit of kind of pulling from um the prototype into into actual in service. But I think the the other thing that we can and are doing in terms of the valley of death is kind of ensuring that you don't slip off on to, on into the water to use the analogy um in terms of the stepping stones. So um so the support that we're trying to provide uh, to suppliers and to academia is around making sure that we don't have that sort of lost in translation moment where you're developing something that you think is useful and wanted by us, but actually it doesn't take into account some sort of key thing that is of really critical importance to defence or security. So that's where that dialogue and that open, transparent dialogue comes in, not just at the beginning, but throughout the innovation journey. Um, and secondly, making sure that actually we've sort of managed expectations about what that journey is going to look like um, and what are the likely steps. So we've um, let you know that you might need to accredit this thing in order to get it into service or that we've let you know that actually um, you're going to need to think about how it integrates with a particular piece of um, equipment and you're going to need to start to test that because actually if we have those conversations early about what that pathway is going to look like, um, we can both anticipate what that journey needs to look like and, and to kind of streamline that. Um, so helping with with that bit of it. Um, and then I guess finally, um, and this is kind of the, the linking point to all of this, is kind of um, helping, helping suppliers think through what is going to be the most viable way of delivering that. So kind of having that frank and open conversation about what is going to work for you as a supplier in order to get that through so is it going to be viable to deliver that on your own as a as a commercial entity or actually do you need to consider partnerships with other suppliers what may they look like what kind of conversations and considerations do you need to factor in um, and starting to think about that delivery um kind of commercialization options early on as well so that actually those have been pre-thought about rather than being the thing that you then have to think about once you've got to the point where you've got a prototype. I suppose there uh, the question of um, how you square competi compet you know competition when when you've got something like that, or whether you get to, you can sole source it. Uh, I'll pass on that, but I think that's that's quite an issue. There's a question from uh, David Kirkpatrick. So uh, I've known David a long time, so I, I've got to include that and. He, he asked the question about, he says, making good evidence-based decisions uh, requires prior investment in research. And I, I, he, he's written a rather fuller question, but I think he, the essence of it is, uh, and it goes to Chris, whether the MOD is spending enough of its own money to be able to make sense of what other people are saying and to be able to evaluate it. He, um, he says... Uh, to what extent, what do you consider an adequate level of defence research to enable the UK to be an intelligent customer for foreign equipment and what higher level would be needed to act as a foundation for in, for the indigenous development of, of kit? So this this question about being an intelligent customer in terms of, tech, I suppose, technical feasibility. Okay, yeah, so I can tackle the sort of base in turn. I'd also add a first piece, uh, which links back to the previous question is, uh, it's one of the things that the SNC world offers is the evidence of why you should try and get something across the valley of death. Often that decision is taken probably quite a long way into the development process. Uh, and what, what, one of our thrusts is to try and get that evidence presented in terms of how it change, it could potentially change the force and the way we do it, military effects almost before we solve the problem, which then prevent presents a compelling case for why you should pull stuff through. In terms of the minimum level we need to do, it's a really great question. One of the things that we, we find with RFC, within our internal uh, capability, clearly we, we have uh, DSTL, obviously, who steward SNC capabilities on behalf of defense, have su significant uh, capacity and breadth of SNC understanding that they, they provide. Uh, yes, DSTL only do stuff that's required in government and that obviously have an extensive sort of supplier network to provide that knowledge. But often we do need that internal expertise when it comes to understanding the impact of the threat and of that sort of operating sort of context. Um, in my mind, 
we have to have a level of defense research to actually make sure um, the, the subject matter experts have sufficient knowledge. You can't do that just by providing advice. You have to do research as well. So I think that's a critical piece that we have to have that critical point where we can actually both train that generation, next generation of people to provide that advice and secondly, have that cadre of people to support MOD as an intelligent customer, which maybe will allow us to buy stuff either off the shelves or from overseas. For a foundation of indigenous development of defense equipment, that is, uh, again, it, it's a tricky problem. I haven't taught numbers because that's that's one of the benefits of not being in the delivery area, being in the strategy area. Um, uh, so I think there is a level of spending that is needed. But my view on this is we know there is somewhere in the region of um, a demand of research that defense needs that probably sits at around 1.5 to 2.2 2 billion. Uh, of that, we budget within our core program that DSL stewards about a billion, so that we know that there is a whole load of stuff that's not being done. To get to that higher level for that ind indigenous development, comes back to what we were talking about, that engagement with industry, engagement with academia. We have to do it jointly. We have to take advantage of other people doing that, uh, doing the innovation in other sectors to be able to apply them to defense problems. It's, it's tricky, uh, and I would not want to put a figure on it, but realistically, if defense can't get the amount of money that's needed to meet all its requirements, we have to be much smarter about raising uh, or, or helping to tailor the innovation that happens within the UK towards defense problems. One of the ways we're looking to get after that is what we do have to offer is really interesting problems. And when we get it right, really good data, which innovators are often crying out for. So in that sense, we're trying to improve the defense offer to, uh, to make it easier for us to work with innovators because I don't think we can do it indigenously or internally as well as we'd like, but we need to reach out to those new suppliers of innovation to do that using the assets the defense can bring. So I'm for, uh, not the, the cleanest answer, but that's, I would certainly not want to put money on it, uh, a figure on it at this point. Trevor, can I just pick up on a couple of things there? First of all, that bit on internal expertise is absolutely vital. Um, whilst I was working in defense intelligence, I was very lucky. I had a DSTL scientist as part of my team who was working with the Turing Institute. So every time someone came to me from industry saying, I built this cool bit of AI, uh, do you want to buy it? I could throw him and his team at it and they would tell us whether or not it was actually as good as they said it was. Quite a lot of the time it wasn't. The second bit on your, um, how much you need to build the foundation of indigenous capability, to a certain extent, it's the other way around. It's how much indigenous capability can you build with the resources you've got? And that means you have to be very targeted. And if frankly, the private sector is doing it already, I'd question why we would want to. Yeah, I, I'll just, we, we're out of time and uh, at least one of our uh, questioners says, thank you for a great event, which I would I would absolutely echo. But uh, I, I, in, in preparing for this, one of the things that I came across was a statement by Lloyd Austin uh, when he was appointing the new head of the Defense Innovation Unit in the US. And he said, uh, DIU's mission is to accelerate the adoption of commercial technology at speed and scale. Is, is that essentially what defense is doing most of the time? It's, it's taking commercial technology and trying to fit it into a, into a defense utility. I think it's a bit of both. And there are always going to be things that uh, there isn't an obvious dual use market for. Um, and therefore, we are going to, we're going to have to build it with our own science and technology expertise. But I think the dial has shifted and what we always used to assume would be coming out of the defence sector and national security sector, a lot of that is now coming out of the private sector and we should absolutely embrace that. But it's a bit of both. Thank you very much. Well, we're, we're right on five o'clock. Uh, Richard King has asked about email addresses, which I'm reluctant to pass on. But what I would say to Richard, if he's still on the call, is that um, 
I can, I, uh, my email me- address is no secret. It's Trevor Taylor at Rusi.org, Trevor Taylor at Rusi.org. And if you'd like to write to me with precisely what you'd want, I'll then pass it on to uh, Chris and John and, and Anita. I uh, thank you very much, Stanley. I feel it's a com. I felt it was a great discussion and completely inadequate. <laughs> we, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I did rather skip uh, some of the questions which were about specific areas of of advance. You know, and one of them is AI, but but um, another one was about hydrogen. I would have one about quantum. Uh, we we stuck to the general place, but it was a really great discussion. I'm sure all our members are very appreciative of the time and, and effort that you took to deliver it. So thank you all very much. And to our members, I, I hope you all felt the same as as uh, Carlos Carpi, who said thank you for a great event. Yeah. So with that, we must we must stop. And I'm sure John and uh, and Chris and, and Anita. I hope I pass across in in 